Hello and welcome. Today I'll be talking about Rust plus IO Euring plus KTLS attempting to answer the question, how fast can we make HTTP? But that's a bummer of a title since I'd have to define what I mean by fast, what I mean by HTTP, and to some extent what I mean by Rust. Do I mean synchronous Rust? Do I mean asynchronous Rust? Are we okay with unsafe code? Are we okay with vulnerabilities as long as we pinky swear to be careful? So please enjoy this new title, which better fits my agenda. Nobody in the Rust space is going far enough with IO Euring, as far as I'm aware. Some things about me, I'm Amos, they, them. I'm known online as Faster Than Lime. I started seriously writing articles about Rust in 2019, along with Colbert, a fictional character who definitely cannot appear in videos, so please stop asking. Uh, I'm known for my deep dives into topics like ELF, TLS, or the other TLS. And I recently turned 30 and consequently started my stint mandated podcast, Self-Directed Research, with my co-host James Munns and the invaluable support of our producer, Amanda Majorovic. Uh, we're the number two tech podcast in Moldova, according to some spam emails we get when you publish podcasts. So, you know, check us out. Okay, here we go with definitions. What's HTTP? Well, back in the days, user agents and servers spoke the same language, but now... Backend services mostly speak HTTP 1.1, a text-based protocol with a lot of room for request and response smuggling, and browsers mostly speak HTTP 2 and 3. But my work so far has been focused on HTTP 1 and 2. I'll get to HTTP 3 when I get more funding. That one does away with TCP altogether, so it's a bit more work. There's a lot of tools to measure the performance of HTTP servers, and they're usually focused on latency. If you can answer 99% of requests under 10 milliseconds, that's your P99. Hey, that's the name of the conference. Having a lower P99 than the next framework is a great way to brag, regardless of how representative it is of real world performance. Unfortunately, as you may know, Rust HTTP is already fast. Frameworks like Hyper have had a literal decade to figure out micro optimizations. That's right, Hyper was started in August of 2014. I'm sure the Rust fad will end any year now and we'll all go back to serious languages. So I said it's fast. Here's an example. When writing out an HTTP response, you have to write the status code as a decimal number. That's true for HTTP 1, text-based protocol, but it's also true for HTTP 2 and 3. Uh, colon status is just a pseudo header. It's still a string. It's the decimal representation of the three-digit status code. And Hyper has the status code as a non-zero U16, because why not? All 900 possible values from 100 to 999 inclusive fit in there. But that means we have to format it as decimal when we want to write an HTTP response. Now, the standard library comes with formatting code, which on this benchmark takes about 21 microseconds to format a status code. The I2A crate does much better, especially if you can use their stack allocated buffer type. But as you already know, the fastest code is no code at all. And in this case, our mystery winner is a 2.7 kilobyte lookup table composed of all possible three digit status codes concatenated together. Note that lookup tables are not the answer to everything. If they're too large, they'll thrash the cache and become slower than just doing the computation in the first place. And that's a good reminder. Network services are not demo scene entries. We're not optimizing for small data structures. We're not handpicking CPU instructions outside of specific use cases like image processing and constant time operations for cryptography. We are, however, very interested in reducing the overhead when it comes to IO because our storage and our networking have gotten really fast. But doing syscalls has become more expensive over time due to mitigations for hardware level vulnerabilities. At least that's my impression. By giving this talk, I'm sure that if I'm wrong, I'm going to find out really, really fast. So faster IO, but slower syscalls, kind of the perfect storm for a model like IO Euring, which is true async all the things. You can submit operations with a single syscall, not just a batch of buffers like vectored writes, but a batch of any kind of IO operation, really, like network, file system, even few texts, even mAdvise for some reason, and even polling file descriptors. In theory, IO Euring should crush everything. But there is one snag with Rust specifically, the only language I will accept to write all this stuff in until something better comes along. There is one snag with the way IO has been modeled in the Rust type system up until now. Say you want to read from a file descriptor, you pass the read method an exclusive reference to a buffer, a mutt byte slice. The whole time read is running, nobody else gets to write to that buffer or even read from that buffer. That's what holding a MUT T means. You have exclusive access to it for now. You can lend it to the kernel for one syscall. And as soon as that syscall returns, you again have exclusive access to that buffer. 
It's important to note that these are the semantics of the read syscall in every language. Rust just gives us one way to describe them explicitly and have the compiler check them. In this function signature, buff is essentially a pointer, but we can tell that the function is not allowed to hold onto it after it returns. If that function is safe for us, then that rule is enforced by the compiler. And if it's not, then it's enforced by being very, very careful. Now, there is unsafe code between Rust and the hardware by design. The idea is to have as little of it as possible so that there's fewer opportunities for bugs. If we now graduate to evented IO epoll style and the read trade from Tokyo, we see the poll read function also takes an exclusive reference of mute u8 slice. The only difference is instead of returning a result, it returns a variant of the poll enum, poll ready if the read happens successfully or not, and poll pending if the read would block, which indicates we should try again later. To know when, we need to register our interest in a file descriptor becoming readable. To do that, we need a context. So actually, I lied, and the function looks more like this. But I don't want to scare you. And because it's able to write partially uninitialized buffers, it doesn't actually take a mud byte slice. It takes a mud read buff, like so. And actually, because read buff keeps track of which parts of it are initialized, there's no need to return the number of bytes read. So we can just return an empty tuple. In one last tiny detail, the receiver is actually pinned to make sure that its address remains stable from one call to the next because async Rust code is turned into state machines that capture all the environments. I really don't have time to cover the details of why I pinned, but I did on my blog extensively, so you can look it up. Luckily, we don't need to care about this today because our next stop is the async read X trait from Tokyo, which looks a lot more like a blocking read. In fact, if we put them next to each other, and we use the async fn syntax, then they look almost the same. But I have two problems with this function signature. The first is that now you're not just lending a buffer to the kernel just long enough for a read syscall. You're lending a buffer to the Tokyo runtime for as long as this read is pending. If you have long-lived connections, then you're paying one buffer per connection, no matter how long the connection has been idle. This problem is not Rust's fault. You can build on top of MIO and do your own buffer management and avoid the problem altogether, like Sozu does, a TCP and HTTP reverse proxy. The fault is specifically with that function signature, that abstraction design choice. And my second problem with that function signature is that it's fundamentally incompatible with IO Uring because of async cancellation. So I guess we do have to learn async Rust after all. In a perfect world, IO operations are never canceled. This function allocates a buffer, calls read exact, which in turn calls read, and then one of two things happen. Either the read succeeds immediately, it writes the buffer and we can return, or it doesn't and read registers its interest in the socket becoming readable and returns pull pending. That bubbles all the way up to the Tokyo runtime, which goes, all right, I guess I'll try this task again when one of the things it's interested in has happened. You might be tempted to think of this async stack trace, but this stack trace exists only in your mind. The real stack trace looks more like this, where each future, the thing in the pin, stores all the local variables it needs and addresses for all the variables it borrows, but also a state machine. Because yielding to the runtime involves all those functions returning. So when it's time to resume the work, when the socket is finally readable, each of these must remember what it was doing so that we may rebuild that stack trace. And it also means that if you somehow lost interest in that future, if some timeout has elapsed or something, you can just throw away the whole thing and just never pull it again. And that's what's happening in this code. The first time around, read exact is pulled. If it would block, it registers interest, returns pull pending, and immediately after sleep is pulled, it hasn't been a second yet, so it registers to be woken up one second from now. We now have two futures in flight, if you will. We have the read future and the sleep future. The next time we're polled, we know that something we're interested in has happened, but we don't know what. So first we pull the read future, which immediately returns poll pending, and then we pull the sleep future, and that one's ready. At which point, we throw away the read future, which means the buff that was mutually borrowed by the read future is no longer mutually borrowed, which means it can drop and we can free it, which is fine because in this version of the code, buff can only be written to when our code is being executed, when it's actually making a syscall, transferring control to the kernel, landing it the buffer just for a function call. But with IOU ring, the write happens in the background whenever the kernel wants to, our future gets pulled after the fact when the write has already happened. So if the sleep completes first and we throw away the read future, then 
as far as the type system is concerned, we're good to mutate the buffer again or free it. But the kernel also thinks it's fine to write to this buffer whenever the read finally completes. And so we've got to use after free here. Our code is no longer safe, which means we've messed up the type modeling of our program. And you may be thinking, surely there's a way to stop the kernel from writing to the buffer. Surely we can cancel that read operation. And that's what the developer of the Rio create thought too. They made their functions return a future type named completion that has a drop implementation. And that drop implementation waits for the in-flight IO operation. That would be a good place to cancel the operation and wait for the kernel to acknowledge the cancellation. There's just one problem. Drop implementations are not guaranteed to run. If we make our evil code slightly more evil and we leak the read future instead of dropping it, then no cancellation is happening. So we still have a use after free. We, we still get to use the buffer, even though the kernel still thinks it can read to it. And uh, yeah, that, that use after free uh, was discovered in 2020, has a nice little CV with a score of 9.8. I would show you the discussion from GitHub, but uh, it's, it's gone. And that's why the only interface that's safe with IO Euring and Rust is to give ownership of the buffer to the read future and to only get it back if the read completes. That's one of the interfaces used in Tokyo Euring, and that's not even taking advantage of the newer stuff in IO Euring, like provided buffers, multi shot operations, and many other goodies. But with an interface that different, we would have to completely rethink buffer management and rewrite everything from the ground up against that new design instead of the classic Tokyo IO traits. And surely no one would bother doing that. I, I did, that's what I did. I started implementing HTTP1 and HTTP2 on top of this style of IO interface. I called it Luna. It uses something very similar to Tokyo Euring, which means it doesn't take advantage of the more advanced stuff yet. But before going any deeper into this, I wanted to answer the question, is it even worth it? With just syscall batching, do we get any measurable performance increase? And this is a pretty hard question because as I've mentioned before, performance can mean many different things and it's famously hard to measure. There's noise and everything. It's like it doesn't want to be measured. So first I spent a couple of years making sure that my HTTP one and two implementation was actually correct because it's very easy to beat someone else on latency if you do a fraction of the validation they do. I ended up porting H to spec from Go to Rust so that I could run those as unit tests, which if nothing else is a very nice thing to have come out of this project. And then as the P99Conf loomed closer, I realized it was probably time to actually measure my thing. I've tried to avoid common mistakes. If you're targeting Linux servers, don't benchmark from your MacBook. In fact, don't benchmark from any laptop because of power management. It, do not put the load generator on the same physical machine as your test server, otherwise they're gonna be fighting for resources. Do not saturate the system because as you approach the maximum load, things start getting weird. The numbers don't mean anything anymore. You know, your basic stuff. So I did my best on short notice. I got a server grade CPU from a dedicated server on Hatzner. That's a CPU from a decade ago, but bear with me. And I blasted H2 load at it from another dedicated server. Still, there's so many different things I could have tried. So I asked Sean, who maintains Hyper, his advice on how to beat Hyper in benchmarks. And you know, after I clarified what I was doing in his driveway, how I got his home address, et cetera, he suggested that Luna, my implementation, probably didn't stand a chance against Hyper in a test with lots of small requests, but with a few large requests, it probably did. So I did a first series of tests trying to establish how much throughput we can consistently get between my two test servers comfortably with both uh, Hyper and Luna set to single core mode without going too high in utilization, something repeatable. And then I set up an automated test harness orchestrated with Python to run H2 load and the test servers on remote hosts, warm them up and measure how many CPU cycles the servers spend trying to serve the same kind of traffic. I did three runs for each combination with 20 second warm ups and two minute measurements to try and account for noise. I wish I had time to do better, but the standard deviation for most of these is under 5%, which I already consider an accomplishment. So without further ado, I give you how many cycles Hyper and Luna spend to serve a few big requests on the left of the graph. And as we move right, we serve more and more smaller requests for the same overall throughput. I think I accidentally made a benchmark about HTTP2 overhead, actually. Sean was bang on, by the way, Luna does spend fewer cycles for large bodies, but things reverse pretty quickly as the parameters change. And you know what my favorite, uh, and you know what my favorite hypothesis for this is? It's that my toy memory allocator that performed so well on micro benchmarks, I think it's actually pretty bad. 
And I think the system allocator is actually doing a lot better when we have that many buffers flying around. I'm not even going to show you latencies that are very comparable. Unfortunately for this test, the client and server machines were in different regions. So the main thing you see is the round trip time. Luna supports TLS via Rust LS for the handshake and kernel TLS offload for the rest. Uh, we see the same phenomenon here of Luna using fewer cycles for larger requests. KTLS should theoretically be even more interesting when proxying from other origins with multi-shot read and SQ poll. There should be very few actual context switches. I'm especially excited to measure this on network interfaces that do TLS encryption in the hardware rather than having the kernel do it. Which brings me to What's next? Uh, the, the benchmarks are repeatable, which is huge. Now I'm able to actually measure any performance improvements I make to Luna, which is surprisingly hard. I want to add more benchmarks. I want to proxy HTTP1 services. I want to serve files from disk. I know Tokyo has a lot of overhead here because they're doing blocking file IO from Thrive pools. Uh, I want to try the newer IOU ring stuff. I want to register file descriptors. Uh, I want to try the buffer ring buffer. Yes, that's the thing. I want to try zero copy send message, which is different from message uh, zero copy. Don't get it mixed up. I want to try to push server hardware a lot more. I want to measure like Tokyo multi-threaded versus sharding requests to multiple current thread runtimes like Glomio does and other Rust async runtime. And looking at my flame graphs, in fact, I would like to move off of Tokyo altogether and use a runtime that's entirely based on Tokyo Uring because we don't need to do atomics. Uh, we don't need to use writes to unpark threads anymore uh, if you do thread per core. So th th there's already some crates in that space in Rust, like slings, but uh, I, I would like something a little more flexible. So what do I need to make that happen? You already know, I need donations in the form of access to server hardware from, from this decade, hopefully. Uh, I'm always open to hearing from experts in various domains like the Linux kernel, that's always helpful. Uh, but most of all, I need funding uh, via GitHub sponsors, et cetera. This is really fun work and I would love to continue working on it, but I can't really justify doing it on my own dime. Um, so far, Fly.io and Shopify have been sponsoring that work. Thanks so much to them for that. Uh, but it's time for someone else to take over. I'd say that the use case I'm most excited about is for reverse proxies, specifically ingress for Kubernetes, because right now we have a choice between fast, which is Nginx, or memory safe, which is traffic and go. And I think we should have both. That's it for me. I, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And if you're planning on reaching out to correct something I got wrong in this talk, remember to start your message with, Amos, you know I love you, but, comma, and then tell me what I got wrong. All right, take care. Bye.